naked, covered in lacerations and stab wounds in the fetal position. Three disturbing stories of r slash let's not meet that will make your skin crawl. Hal's waiting room. During my early 20s, I worked as a meter reader in Iowa City. A meter reader is the person who records how much electricity, gas, or water you've used each month. If your meters are on the inside and you want an accurate bill, a meter reader must enter your home whether you're there to let them in or not. Just to clarify, we only entered homes if consent was given when the customer first signed up for service. Customers also provided us with keys, if necessary. Entering a home when the owner isn't present is something that I never got used to. No matter how loudly I knocked, I never shook the uneasy feeling that I wasn't welcome. The inside of the home is the ultimate private space. A home's exterior is just the image of ourselves that we project to the rest of the world. But the further you venture inside, the closer you come to truly seeing what kind of person lives there. And if you want the raw, unfiltered truth, head for the basement. I hate basements. I've seen walls that look like giant, static-filled TV screens, until I realized it was roaches scurrying across a white background. Cobwebs so thick and dusty that it looked like the cotton candy machine exploded at the Spider County Fair. I've seen rats, snakes, feces, weapons, neglected children, abused pets, homeless squatters, massive hordes, bizarre sexual items, a makeshift meth lab, and even a coffin. There are rational explanations for all of these things, well, maybe not the coffin, but there was one basement where what I found was beyond the grasp of logic, and that's what made it so terrifying. It was an old apartment house. From the outside, it looked like every other house on the block. I entered the back door and found myself at the top of a staircase. I ran my hand along the wall until it grazed a light switch. I flipped the switch, but no lights turned on. I wasn't carrying a flashlight. A typical route involved five or six hours of walking, so I carried as little as possible. Oftentimes I used the light from my handheld screen, but it only illuminated whatever was about a foot in front of it. So armed with the world's worst lantern, I made my way down into the darkness. Once at the bottom, I blindly shuffled across the room, one baby step at a time. With arms outstretched and head down, I eventually reached the far side of the basement. I shined the dim light from my handheld along the wall, and discovered two doors. Each door led into its own small room. I chose the door on the right, and found the meters in the far corner. As I entered the reeds, I began hearing noises coming from the other room. Something was moving, and there was whimpering that grew louder the longer I listened. I eventually realized it was a dog. It sounded weak and distressed. I tried to open the door, but it was locked. At this point, the dog was scratching the other side of the door. I felt helpless. I reported it when I got back to the office, but I couldn't shake the thought of that dog. It stuck with me over the next month, until it was time to return. So there I was, one month later, back within that basement. At least this time I knew where the meters were located. I shuffled back to the little room on the right, while keeping my ears open for any sounds coming from the other room. This time I heard nothing. I read the meters and started making my way back, but I couldn't shake the memory of that dog. Was it still trapped inside that room? My curiosity got the best of me. I stood outside the door for a few moments, listening. Still nothing. That's when I made a huge mistake. I tried to open the door. I had no more than jiggled the doorknob when I first heard it. Screams. Blood-curdling screams, unlike anything I'd ever heard. Sounds that I didn't think a human was capable of producing. Short, piercing, high-pitched shrieks followed abruptly by a low, drawn-out, guttural moan that ultimately morphed into something that I can only describe as crying, but much louder. It was all over the place, like some sort of psychotic, freeform jazz. I stumbled backwards, nearly losing my balance. I shouted something like, hello? Who's in there? There was no response, just screams. Are you okay? Do you need help? Still no response, just screams. There was no doubt that I yelled loud enough for him to hear me. He didn't want my help. He wanted me gone. I fumbled my way through the darkened room, toward the exit. When I reached the top of the stairs, I just stood there, listening. I was trying to wrap my mind around what I was hearing. I waited for the screaming to stop, but it never did. When I finally left, it was still as loud and demented as when it began. I felt relieved, but that quickly vanished when I realized I had to do it all over again next month. I reported what I'd heard, but nothing came of it. As my return drew nearer, a sense of dread grew inside of me. 
What kind of lunatic sits alone in total darkness and silence? My mind created endless explanations for what kind of hell laid beyond that door. By the time I returned, I'd built him up in my mind so much that anyone other than the devil himself would have been a letdown. But there was no sign of him the next month, or even the next several months. I'd nearly given up on solving the mystery, when a stroke of luck pulled me back in. One night, I went to a concert with my friend Lara. After the show, I gave her a ride home. She'd moved somewhat recently, so she had to give me directions. I didn't pay much attention to where she was leading me, until she pointed to a house a ways up the street. I couldn't believe it. She had moved into the house with the mysterious room in the basement. This sounds weird, but have you noticed anything odd about the basement at this? I began to ask. But before I could finish my sentence, she blurted out, a crazy guy lives down there. Finally, I had confirmation. She went on to tell me that even though her apartment was in the attic, she often heard him yelling late at night. But that wasn't all, she had actually met him. One day, while walking to her car, she saw him standing in the lawn. He stood perfectly still, with no expression on his face. He was directly in her path, so she cautiously made her way around him. She noticed he was staring at her, so she offered a friendly, hi. As she passed. He had no reaction, except for one unsettling exception. He stuck out his tongue, then quickly sucked it back into his mouth and resumed acting like a statue. Thoroughly creeped out, she got in her car and drove away. Two or three months later, I finally met him myself. I entered the back door, like I had so many months before. This time something was different. There was a light on in the basement. I peered down the staircase. At the bottom, a ragged looking dog was staring back at me. It was the same dog I'd heard during my first visit. Then I noticed something else. Behind the dog, I could see a pair of bare feet. The ceiling blocked my view of the rest of whoever was standing there, but it didn't matter. I knew it was him. I should have left right then, but I didn't. I know this probably doesn't make sense, but at this point my desire to finally get some answers outweighed my fear. I shakily called out, meet a reader, and started to make my descent. As I made my way down, more of him was revealed. He looked to be middle-aged. His head was shaved, and his eyes were wild. He was wearing pants, but no shirt. What I remember most was how lean and sinewy his body looked. It had the look of a body that was never at rest. I explained who I was and what I was doing there. To my surprise, not only did he talk to me, but he actually sounded somewhat normal. The volume and pitch of his voice was odd, but he said the same sorts of things that people typically said to meter readers. I even started to doubt whether or not he was the same man I'd heard screaming, but his behavior slowly removed all doubt. As I read the meters, he rapidly paced back and forth. He was constantly wringing his hands together, and spastically cocking his head from side to side. The longer he talked, the more agitated he became. He began grimacing, and little verbal tics started popping up in his speech. Every so often, he'd blurt out a loud awe. In the middle of a sentence. He was trying to suppress these sounds, but he was losing the battle. I started to make my way to the exit. He followed. His verbal outbursts grew louder and more frequent. I was petrified. When I reached the stairs, I drew our conversation to an end and said goodbye. As I turned to head up the staircase, he could no longer hold it in. Screams. The very same unforgettable screams that I'd heard coming from the locked room. I ran up the stairs as fast as my legs would carry me, flung the door open, and rushed back into the daylight. A month or two later, I had a couple friends, including Lara, over to my place. I was excited to tell her about my encounter. But as I was relaying what happened, I could tell that something else was on her mind. When I finished telling my story, she told me about something she'd seen a couple weeks earlier. One day, she noticed lights flashing outside her window. She looked outside just in time to see police officers placing the man from the basement in the back seat of a squad car. She later found out from another tenant that he had attacked someone with a knife. That was the last we ever saw of him. I don't know what became of the man in the basement. I like to think that he got the help he needed, but maybe that's just because I'd rather not think about the alternative. The, the man, man in the, the brush. To give some explanation and background knowledge for this whole encounter. I was around 15 at the time this occurred. I was camping out in the middle of nowhere with my family and part of my extended family, my aunt, uncle, and cousins. I was the oldest kid there in the RV, so you can probably understand how it felt to have no one else to do the stupid crap I did back then with. 
With a good two year gap between me and the inferiors, it was almost like Nirvana when I got to the campground and met the other teenagers. These were all people we knew fairly well from previous camping trips, so it was considered normal to hit it off with them from the start and act like we've known each other forever within the hour. Now, the story. My parents trusted me a lot, not a lie. I liked my fun, but I liked getting home in time for dinner equally as much. So when I was gone most of the day with other people from the camp, they didn't think much of it. The only rule was that I had to be back at the RV to eat dinner, and before 8.30, 20.30, in the evening. So picture this, group of six teenagers, 15 to 16, out in the middle of the woods with no adult supervision for the vast majority of the day. Just a recipe for success right there. But this particular day, we found a neat little deer trail we hadn't found in the two years we'd been there before. On second thought, though, it didn't really seem like a deer trail. It snaked through a really thick part of the underbrush, maybe a foot, 30 centimeters, of clear ground, 3.5 feet, 1 meter, clear of branches going upwards. It's a really hard thing to pick out of the brush, unless you're either really looking or know where it is. It was promptly explored, marked with a broken branch outside of the entrance, and quickly forgotten. Except, I remembered this special little tunnel. That night, while we were all eating dinner, one of the adults proposed that we played manhunt out in the woods. At night. Not everyone was totally on board with this idea, but in the grand scheme of the plan, they were quashed down like autumn leaves. Everyone got a flashlight, and everyone was assigned to a team. For those of you who aren't sure what manhunt is, here's an explanation, everyone playing is given a flashlight, and they are divided into two groups. It's basically like glorified flashlight tag, but there's a catch, as you catch people, you have to correctly identify who they are, and if you can, they join forces with the hunters. The last man standing gets a candy bar or something, whatever is being offered as a prize. This is how we played it, anyways. For the first round, I get lumped in with the runners, those who are getting chased by the hunters. We get a 5 minute head start to run, climb a tree, whatever the hell we want to do to evade the hunters. Usually, I'm the one up in the tree, but that never really worked out as being the winning spot. So, to try and score a win for once, I decide to play the cat and use one, surefire method of escape. And the hiding spot was the rude little path through the thicket. It took most of the head start time to find the thing because it was so well hidden and out of the way. As I passed hiding spots, I heard hushed, smothered whispering between siblings who were questioning my actions, like a bird's wings rustling when it's fluffing itself. It should be noted that I have bad hearing, my ears are possibly my greatest asset in this game. But when I'm just reaching the destination, I hear the short blast of the air horn announcing that the five minutes are up. I swan dove into this minute little path in the undergrowth, shuffling on my hands and knees until I'm about halfway in crouching down like some huge, malformed quail. The hunters are doing an initial sweep through the trails, looking for obvious hiders and people caught out trying to change spots. When they finally reach me, they reach the dead end and go straight back. I try to readjust myself, and crawl further down the tunnel. I honestly don't know how it happened, but I found an even more hidden path within that one, and accidentally, I dragged my stupid body down the rabbit hole. Except, instead of ending in a dead end, this one ended in a slight hollow. I don't ever want to describe exactly what I found there. I'm sorry, but I just can't. It was a younger looking woman, naked, covered in lacerations and stab wounds in the fetal position. Her glassy, glazed eyes seemed to look straight through me. I won't go any further than that. I was too scared to scream, and I froze there while dark, burgundy stains formed on my jeans. I froze there, in a pseudo-catatonic position like a marble carving for what felt like hours. And then, I heard someone else coming along that path. Have you ever been so scared that for one moment, one insane moment, you truly consider something incredibly stupid as a viable option to escape? That was one of those times. I let out a short, trembling whimper, and started moving. Whoever was on the path stopped, and then eagerly started moving forward again. I could hear their panting, uneven breaths of a man, a horrible marker of whoever it was getting closer and closer to me by the second. By some wondrous, beautiful miracle, he missed the path leading to the brushy hollow. I heard him moving down past the entrance, dragging something clunky and awkward behind him. I heard clinking noises, and the occasional effort to silence the small, sharp noises. I heard a low curse, somewhere towards the end of the tunnel, and I blasted out of the undergrowth tunnel like a bullet forcing its way out a barrel. Cracks, 
Crashes and obnoxious rustling was all around me as I heard the man sharply intake a breath and begin to move towards me. The horse, deep panting was getting closer and closer to me, a testament to how I was too slow at exiting. Somehow, I exploded out of the entrance, got onto my wobbly, half-asleep legs, and started booking it down the trail. The unknown pursuer was close behind me for a bit, but it seemed like he was too exhausted to chase me at the same speed for long. I know everyone loves to rip on the fact that people always trip in horror movies, but in all honesty, tripping is something I am amazed I didn't do. With adrenaline coursing through me at the speed of Usain Bolt, trying to make my jello-like, unsteady walking appendages work to move me away from whoever was behind me was like trying to run on water. It felt like an eternity, but I finally reached the main trail running back to the camp, and sprinted down at screaming bloody murder. Confused faces looked out from the trees, and I think someone called after me. Reaching the camp was easy, but trying to explain why I woke up half the people in the camp and bolted out of the woods at breakneck speed was harder. When I finally choked the words out to explain, I remember a profound, insidious silence throughout the group of adults waiting at the mouth of the trail. I really don't remember a whole lot from that point on. I know the cops were called, and my mother and aunt ran shrieking and wailing along the trail, calling for the other kids to come back to safety. When someone's yelling like that, you don't ignore it. They rounded everyone up in 30 seconds flat, and barreled back into the camp. The police found a man out in the woods, creeping along the trail, clutching a knife. A black garbage bag with a plethora of sharp instruments and a saw was found abandoned on the trail, some speckled and smeared with dried blood. I don't think there's really any getting over it. I still have nightmares sometimes, of the man chasing me, breathing heavily down the back of my neck, trying to catch me. Sometimes, he succeeds. The Moonlight Motel This encounter takes place several years ago in a remote part of the Australian outback. For a bit of background, I'm a pretty built, 6 foot 2 dude, and I was around 26 years old at the time. Now, on to the story. I was on a road trip with a mate, traveling around the central Queensland outback in my old, semi-reliable Nissan X-Trail. We're both science nerds and had heard about this amazing dinosaur trail out this way, which is basically a grouping of three areas, Winton, Richmond and Hewenden, that have had previous dinosaur bone discoveries, still have fossils as well as a seriously awesome dinosaur track with preserved foot imprints. We were staying at a place three hours from Winton for a couple of days, and were pretty keen to check out this trail. So we made the decision to do the six hour round trip in a day. We were pretty ambitious, and stupid, back then. We left at 9 a.m. the next morning, car packed with lunch, several liters of water and my trusty GPS, and off we went. It was a long drive, and halfway through my aircon decided to cark it. If any of you have visited Australia in the summer, you would know it's brutally hot. So, I'm sure you can imagine the three-hour trip there without aircon, with the eventuality of the six-hour round trip, was hell. To make matters worse, my GPS also stopped working as the map software didn't recognize the area we were in. Luckily I had an old Ray FedEx in my back seat, but it was pretty tough to revert to map reading when you're used to a computer screen telling you where to go. Especially given we're talking the Australian outback here, complete with dirt tracks for roads and very limited signage. But, I digress. Finally we make it to the trail, and kick around there for a couple of hours, not gonna lie, it was pretty awesome then decide to make the trip back as it was starting to get later in the afternoon and we didn't want to be driving back in the dark. As we're about to leave, this gnarly old guy, who appeared to be an employee of the trail company, dressed all in camouflage gear asked us about where we were from and where we were heading. He gave me the stink eye when I was vague with the details, but my mate told him the name of the town where we were staying. He took a real liking to my mate, and he laughed when he told him about our lengthy journey in. Apparently we had taken the long route and there was a much quicker way to get back, that would shave about an hour off the trip. We jumped at the directions he gave us, ain't nobody got time for an extra hour in an aircon less oven, all verbal, which we wrote down. Off we went on our merry way, thinking how lucky we were to have met this old dude who gave us some sweet intel on a shortcut home, but I can't deny there was definitely a creep vibe coming off him. Based on the directions he gave us, we went winding along several roads in an area I had never been in, and eventually settled straight on this narrow dirt road. We were supposed to reach an intersection after about half an hour, take a right and continue on that road until we got to a main highway that would take us back. After an hour and a half of driving on this dirt trail, though, we still hadn't reached this intersection. I was starting to freak out a bit, 
thinking we'd miss the turn, but my mate was completely chilled out and was sure we'd get there eventually. I think he thought I was driving too slowly, but there are kangaroos out there, man, and those things are seriously dangerous if you hit one. We had been traveling for a while now, it was getting later and later in the day, and it got to the point where the petrol in the tank was only a quarter full. There were no houses, other roads or cars in sight and I was really not comfortable with where this was headed. The middle of nowhere. In a remote area in the wasteland that is the Australian outback. There weren't even any trees. Only this dirt road and desolate, dry bushland and shrubs as far as the eye can see. I stop the car and tell my mate to get the binoculars out of the back to take a look around in case he can see a landmark. Yes, I carried binoculars in my car, still do. He obliges, and can just make out a house-like structure not too far in the distance, so we made the decision to head for that. We figured it could be a house and maybe the people would be nice enough to give us some petrol to top us up, and some better directions out of there. As we neared this structure, it became apparent that it was not a house at all. We pulled up out front, and see that it's an old caravan that has been burned to a shell from the inside out. It's still got three black and partial walls up though, so we can't see all the way in and it looks like someone's been there recently because there are animal bones strung up all over the place, and a cow skull at the entrance to the caravan. Some of the animal bone things even have grass or horse hair woven into them, and they were arranged like decorations. Then we see this hand-painted sign that's been staked into the ground, with the words Moonlight Motel on it. My alarm bells are ringing loud and clear. I nudge my friend to say let's get the hell out, but he's distracted by something in the distance. It's a car. Coming in the direction we had just come from, would have been only 10 minutes behind us the entire time we were driving, but I didn't see it once. It's kicking up a ton of dust, which indicates that it's coming towards us fast. It is at this point that we both hear this creepy scratching sound coming from the burned out caravan, like someone is scratching at the wall from the inside. I move a little closer to try and see what it is, and there is a person in there peeking out at us from a hole in the damaged wall. Then, this childlike voice, that is obviously a grown man imitating a little girl, giggles and says are you here to play with me? My mate and I both look at each other and book it out of there, back to the inner sanctum of the x rail. Just as I am about to reverse out, the other car stops just behind my car with the high beams on. I can't see the driver, but they're in my way so I can't reverse out from where I'm stationed. I have no choice but to drive forward, and turn around that way, narrowly missing the stake motel sign. As we're turning to leave, the driver starts blaring the horn. Just hammering it, for no reason at all. I just speed off, back in the direction we came, and the other car doesn't follow. It's getting to twilight at this stage, and pretty dangerous to be out on these country roads once it's dark, because of the kangaroo situation. But we're feeling a bit better as we manage to navigate our way back to where we came from, the dinosaur trail, and even start to joke around about what happened. The person in the other car was probably just honking at us to get our attention to help with directions, or something. I pull into the parking lot and go to the front desk area of the company that runs the tours. I explained that we had gotten lost on our way back to the town we were staying at, and the lady there is kind enough to give us just enough petrol for the ride back. I couldn't help myself, and mentioned to her that her workmate is a real jerk for giving us those weird directions, we figured that there was no way we messed up the advice he had given us and she gives me a weird look and asks me to describe the guy. I do, and her face goes funny and she says, that man does not work here. I saw him talking with the tourists today, and my boss had to ask him to leave. He kept trying to get the details of where people were staying, and telling them that he had vacancies at his place and they could stay there. At the Moonlight Motel. So, creepy old dude, pretending to give helpful directions to a couple of city folk to trap, and potentially murder, them in your lovely accommodation, Let's not meet. Thanks for listening to Radio TTS. Hit the subscribe button and activate the notification bell to avoid creepy strangers in your basement. Share your thoughts about these stories in the comments below, and remember, there could be someone in your basement too. <laughs>